Put another way, it is the benefited one benefiting others. One self has attained to great wisdom and wishes for all sentient beings to attain to great wisdom. With great wisdom, there will be no more upside down thinking. Past vows refers not to vows made in the present, but the ones he had made since the origin. Since the origin, when was that? It was countless eons ago when he made those vows. The power of vows from lives past is called past vows. Similar to the events of the past lives, one of the twelve divisions of sutras, which are accounts of events in the lives past, here the past vows of earth, star, bodhisattva, other vows he made in his past lives, not at the present, because by now he has already fulfilled his vows. What were the vows he made? He vowed, until the hells are empty, I vow to forego Buddhahood. When all beings are saved, will I then certify to Bodhi? Hells refers to all the hells. Anytime the hells are not yet empty, he will hold off on becoming a Buddha. Only when the hells are completely empty, will he become a Buddha. Now think about that. How great is that vow power? Earth Bodhisattva says, I will be in the house to receive and guide all the hungry ghosts for each day that they have not been laid from suffering to bliss for one more day I will hold off on Buddhahood. The hungry ghosts in the house must completely gain deliverance, leave suffering and attain bliss and then I will become a Buddha. Let's think that over. The common sentient beings create is endless, so are their afflictions. Then how could the hells ever come to an end? Only when sentient beings' afflictions were ended and their karmic obstruction cleared, will would the hells then be empty? Yet, as we sentient beings' karmic obstruction cannot be eradicated or their afflictions ended, how will the hells ever be empty? From the standpoint of contemporary literary scientists and philosophers, wouldn't the vows which Earth Star Bodhisattva made, the power of his vows, be considered the silliest of conduct and notions? Why do I say the silliest of conduct and notions? He first had the notion which he put into action and which manifested in his conduct. However, isn't this kind of conduct and notions way too foolish? Why? The bottom line is it cannot be done. Since fundamentally the house can never be empty, does it follow that fundamentally Earth Star Bodhisattva stands no chance to ever become a Buddha? No. It is not the silliest kind of conduct and notions. It is the kindest, most compassionate, type of conduct and notions, and also the most filial. Why do I say that? Earth Star Bodhisattva perceived in his contemplation that his mother had fallen into the house where she was undergoing great sufferings, and he asked the Buddha to help take his mother across. Who is Earth Star Bodhisattva really? He is the venerable Mahamagogalayana, and he serves as a Bodhisattva in the house. Why would he want to do that? He felt the pain which his mother underwent in the house and reflected on the issue of extending fidelity for one's elders to others' elders. If my mom went through such uh, sufferings, others' moms could also be put through the same sufferings, he thought. Therefore, with a fidelity that is equal, level, and indiscriminating, he sought to rescue all hell beings and guide them from suffering to bliss. That is what Earth Star Bodhisattva's vows are about. No amount of words can fully describe the extent of his vow power. Again, let us go over the word Earth. There are ten meanings to the word, and though the ten still cannot cover all its functions, they give the general idea. First, vast and great. Do you see that the earth is vast and great? Some of you are saying, 
Drama master, you may skip that one. We all knew it's vast and great. Why bother? Just because everyone knew that, all the more I need to bring it up to your attention. Second, relied upon by sentient beings. All sentient beings rely on the earth to sustain life. Do you know of any sentient beings that do not do that? Surely none of them lives in empty space. Third, not given to likes and dislikes. The earth has no likes or dislikes. It does not pick and choose, dictating you stay here, that sentient being there. I don't want you. No way. Sentient beings, good, bad, wholesome, and evil, together with the tigers, seal deer, monkeys, and everything else, all live and rely on the earth. All the more, it is not given to preferences, references, or biases. Some people might claim, Oh, I know, the earth simply has no awareness. It's insensate. Do you know for sure that it has no awareness? The earth's awareness and perception is beyond the scope of our awareness and perception. The earth has its awareness because it is also one of the sentient beings. Fourth, acceptance of great rains. It can withstand the most forbidding of downpours. Fifth, bringing forth vegetation. Sixth, uh, reposi uh, repository for seeds. All the seeds are buried underground. Seventh, the seventh is burying many treasures. There are lots of valuables in the ground. Eight, yielding various medicines. All medicines are produced from the earth. Ninth, unmoved by blowing winds. Not even the gustiest of winds, not even hurricanes can move the earth. What about earthquakes? They're not caused by movement of winds. Tenth, unstirred at the land draws. When the lions thaw, all creatures are scared, but the earth does not flinch. In light of these ten meanings, Earth Star Bodhisattva takes the Earth to represent his name. This sutra basis is titled on a person and a drama, with Earth Star Bodhisattva being the person and his past vows, the drama. The Chinese word for past is ben, as in foundation or origin. Both suggest the past and indicate that this word vows Earth Star Bodhisattva made previously. Previously, countless eons ago, in life after life, he constantly made these vows to perfect his filiality, to serve his parents with filial devotion, and to save and take them across at the expense of his own life. Such was Earth Star Bodhisattva's vow power. I have explained the term Sutra on many previous occasions, but it helps to go over it in every Sutra lecture. Some of you learned it from prior lectures, yet others have not been to one until now and are not clear about its principles. Sutras offer a path for cultivation which everyone may walk on. If you wish to become a Buddha, you must take this route. This is the way to Buddhahood. Therefore, sutra means path. It also has the meaning of the carpenter's chalk line, as in China, the carpenter's ink line. The carpenter snaps the line he pulls out of the ink pad to mark a straight black line. By the same token, sutras help us tell the proper from the deviant. Moreover, sutra has the meaning of garland, as sutras string together principles like flowers in a garland. There are four more meanings, threading, attracting, permanent, and law. Threading is to perform it into and thread together to the set of principles, so none will be left out or lost. Analogous to the magnetic pull on iron feelings, attracting is to attract and support those with the potentials for transformation. The drama the Buddha taught takes the cross and transforms living beings according to their potentials and affinities. The scriptures based on the Buddha's words, like magnets, draw those sentient beings who are due to be transformed. 
Similarly, you have come to my Sutra lectures because this attracting power brought you here. Weaker power like mine draws fewer people, stronger power more people. This attracting power has drawn someone Ron Epstein all the way from Seattle here, like the magnetic pull on iron feelings. Before you know it, its invisible power has already drawn you in, thus attracting. In the Cantonese dialect, the word attracting is used to describe parents' loving care for their children. The term to attract and to accept refers to how the Buddha treats sentient beings with kindness and compassion, and in turn sentient beings regard the Buddhas with respect. That is how the Buddhas attract and accept all sentient beings. Another meaning for sutra is permanent, that which does not change. Not one word may be omitted and not one word added. That which may not be increased or reduced is called permanent, unchanged and forever unchanged. So you want the sutras changed, you will end up in the house not due to some strong arm or too crazy, but because the principles in the sutras as it were are still like are still like and cannot be changed, thus permanent. The fourth meaning is law, which is uh, adhered to, th uh, to throughout the three periods of time, those of the past, present and future, why the third meaning, permanent, means being unchanged from days of old to today. In all three periods of time, this is the law to abide by, by in cultivation, an internal law, a permanent, not temporary, constitution. Sutra is a Sanskrit word. Its Chinese translation means scriptures that totally. In the olden days in China, transfers of real estate titles did not have to be recorded at the county recorder's office. Instead, the contract would be written on a piece of paper which was then folded and cut zigzag with scissors into two halves for each of the parties to hold on to. So what proof would we have if, say, you offer to sell me your lot and agree to, to buy your land. We would each produce our tolly and the zigzag should match to a T as, uh, as in Chinese proverb alluding to the practice of scribing words or insignia. On a bamboo segment later split into two tollies, the matching of which identified their bearers, their bearers as parties to the prior agreement. A much like the two tollies of a halved bamboo denoting an agreement. That is called tollying, to correspond agree or match. What does scriptures that tolly mean? Above, they tolly with the principles of all Buddha. The principles of all Buddha suggest the minds of all Buddhas, i.e. upward they match the Buddha's minds. Below, they totally with the potentials of sentient beings. Downward, they are, in, they are in keeping with sentient beings' propensities. What are sentient beings' potentials and propensities? Sentient beings are like grass, trees, medicinal herbs, i.e. vegetation. All the plants being rooted in the earth are equivalent to the potentials. Also, the plants themselves may be likened to sentient beings. This analogy might help you understand better. Comparing plants to sentient beings, when it rains and as the rainwater falls to the earth, all the flowers, grass, shrubs and trees flourish in their own way. Big trees get more nourishment, small shrubs less nourishment. Grass gets the nourishment befitting grass, Flowers get the nourishment befitting flowers, equal and level, and that is totally tolling with sentient beings' potentials. Sutras are like the rainwater falling on all the major things, thus billowing totally with sentient beings' potentials. They totally in the sense that you will receive however much you are due for. 
For instance, as I am lecturing on the Sutra, those among you who are wise will add to their wisdom, and the dim ones will also add to their wisdom, but the wise ones will get to add a bit more. Each person will get each own, each, each own nourishment, own a share of benefit, while those lacking gurus reject the Dharma rain and get no benefit from it. Therefore, it was to each own benefit by tolling downward with sentient beings' potentials. Sutra has all those meanings plus many more if we were going to cover more of them. That was just an overview. In life after life, earth star bodhisattva remained filial to his parents and therefore earth star sutra is a Buddhist scripture on filial piety. Filiality is the root and foundation of humanity. If one fails to be filial to one's parents, one is remiss in the responsibilities of being human. Why? Our parents gave birth to us and raised us. Now that we have grown up, if we neglect to repay their kindness, we have not lived up to our obligations as human beings. All through his life, Confucius advocated filial piety and as part of his legacy, classic of filial piety gives an account of a dialogue between Confucius and his disciple Teng Tzu, Teng Shen, on the subject of filiality. When Confucius was at his abode and his disciple Teng Tzu was in attendance on him, the master said, Shen, the ancient kings had an ultimate virtue and a crucial principle. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Teng Tzu rose from his seat and said, How would I, Shen, lacking intelligence, be able to know this? The master said, Our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filiality. The Classics of Filiality, Chapter 1 The Scope and Meaning of the Treaties. Of the Treaties. Once on when Confucius was unoccupied and his disciple and his disciple Teng Tzu were sitting by in attendance on him. The master said, Shen, the ancient kings had a perfect virtue and all embracing rule of conduct through which they were in accord with all under heaven. By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what that, what it was? Teng rose from his mat and said, How should I, Shen, who am so devoid of intelligence, be able to know this. The master said it was filial piety. Now filial piety is the root of all virtue and the stem out of which grows all moral teaching. Sit down again and I will explain the subject to you. Our bodies to every hair and bit of skin are received by us from our parents and we must not presume to endure, endure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. When we have established our character by the practice of the filial cause so as to make our name famous in future ages and thereby glorify our parents, this is the end of filial piety. It commences with the service of parents. It proceeds to the service of the ruler. It is completed by the establishment of character. When Confucius was at his abode in his dormitory at the school, his disciple Teng Tzu was in attendance on him. As a student of Confucius, Teng Tzu was obliged to serve his teacher. Confucius stressed filiality in that one should be filial to one's parents and likewise be respectful to one's teachers and elders. So, for instance, sometimes Confucius might like some tea and Teng Tzu would oblige with a cup of tea. 
He would take care of things that Confucius wanted done. Confucius said, "The ancient kings, China's former sagely emperors of yore, had an utmost virtue, the greatest and of the highest degree attainable, and a crucial principle which is most important, through which they were in accord with their own under heaven." By the practice of it, the people were brought to live in peace and harmony. If the common people made use of this principle, they would trade, strive for peace, and there was no ill will between superiors and inferiors. Do you know what it was? Confucius asked. Tsang vacated his seat. He got up and said, "How would I, Shen, being very dense and lacking intelligence, be able to know this?" No, I do not know," the master said. Confucius went on to say that our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. Do not casually harm or damage them. This is the beginning of filial piety, the start of filial duty. However, currently there is a group of individuals in the United States who misunderstand filial piety. What is that about? Raving Chinese Confucius says, "Our bodies and hair and skin we received from our parents and must not presume to injure or wound them. This is the beginning of filial piety. Filial piety. A bunch of hippies crop up who do not cut their hair or wash their faces." That would amount to injuring the hair and on the skin. You see, that thinking is wild of the mark. To not presume to injure or wound them does not equate to not cutting one's hair or washing one's face. It is telling you not to bring damage to them. Haircuts are part of the terms. Since the going trends call for haircuts, then one should go with the trends. Today's hippies want to turn the times around. Brandishing Confucius says, yet at the same time, guess what? They smoke opium and marijuana and take LSD as if those do not injure or wound their bodies. Those things kill off who knows how many body cells, ruin their health, and practically run their bodies down. They chalk it up. To feel liberty, and meanwhile, their parents are the furthest thing from their minds, consigned to oblivion. Ask them who their parents are, and they draw a blank. And they are supposedly observing Chinese filial liberty. That is a complete mix-up. This erroneous thinking needs to be completely corrected. From refusing to cut their hair to engage their bodies in shady dealings, even robberies and vices, where do you suppose they will end up? If one day they should get gunned down, that would truly be unfilial. Once they get into illegal dealings or robberies, they will either end up killing some policeman or getting killed by the police. Now, is that to not presume to injure? Injure or wound them. The beginning of filial piety. What a mistake! Me being in this country, I wish for this country citizens to follow rules and abide by the law, and therefore I hope to set this deleterious habit right. Do not give in to hatred or resentment. Adopt the nature of the sages and worthy. Be careful with your thoughts and actions. Wherever we are, we should be of benefit to the local people, to the country, and to the world. Do not be a menace to the world. That is my wish. If everyone behaves this way, rejecting work and refusing to be productive, this country will definitely go downhill. Therefore, as we are now learning the Buddha's teachings, we should all take up jobs, and by working at our jobs. Help the world and humankind by setting good examples ourselves. We influence society so that human minds, as a whole, will change for the better. That is the responsibilities of Buddhists. The United States has a great legal system and many fine institutions. 
especially the education system, which has made education widely available and better. It serves as an example for the world. Just one more thing to add to that. If everyone also learns to be filial to his or her parents, and as it is said, a superior person tends to the basis, for when the basis is established, the way comes forth. Filial piety and fraternal regard. Are they not the basis to being human? If they can further find that basis and source, then when everyone is filial to their parents, this country will definitely prosper. A superior person needs to find the foundation and source, and once the foundation and source can stand firm, the way will come forth. What is the foundation? Filial piety towards parents, toward parents, and fraternal regard for siblings, i.e., courtesy toward one's siblings and peers, no fighting. Filial piety and fraternal regard. Ah, uh, the foundation for everyone. People who are filial to their parents steer clear of the various illegal dealings and abide by the law, making them good citizens of the country. When all the people of the country have become good citizens, we can serve as good citizens of the entire world. They will lead humanity as a whole well on the right track. That is why the first order of business for everyone is to know to be filial to his or her parents. Otherwise, that is the point in parents having kids. After giving birth to them, the parents still have to raise them for the next eighteen years, and then the kids fly away from the nest, leaving their aging parents behind. Sure, the par the parents. Can move into retirement homes and will have the government as their support system, but there is no kindred affliction to speak of. They're left on their own, almost like they're all alone in the world and with no one to rely on. It would be best for children to show filial devotion and care for their own parents, allowing them peace of mind in the waning years of their lives. Or else, once the kids grow up, they fly away just like birds, off to no one knows where. A plums and crows. A Chinese saying goes: A lamb kneels to nurse; the crow returns to feed its parents. When the young crow grows up, when the young crow grows up, it finds food for its parents and nourishes them until the the old crow are strong enough to fly again. Only then. Will the young crow's duties come to an end? Therefore, to the Chinese people, the crow is the filial bird. When a suckling lamb takes milk from mum, it kneels down on its four legs. Humans who fail to be filial to their parents do not even measure up to lambs or crows. That is not intended as a put down, rather a principle that everyone should be aware of. It is especially efficacious if humans can be filial to their parents. How is it? How is that so? The story of Kuo Chu. There is the Kuo Chu burying his baby story in China that goes like this. Kuo Chu was a very poor man, the poorest of the poor. He had a wife and a baby son. He also had a very old mother. His mum had lost all her teeth and could not eat any solid food. So she would take the milk from her daughter-in-law. That is, up until the baby came along. Now, with two mouths to feed, there was not enough milk to go around, and both grandma and the baby were left hungry. If the milk were to go to feed grandma, the baby would starve to death. If the milk were allotted to the baby, Grandma would die. So it was up to Kuo Chu to come up with a solution. Kuo Chu talked it over with his wife, and being the most filial son, presented this rational. Since they both were still young, they could have many more children in their long married life ahead. But Mum was very old, and her days were numbered. So they should dispose the baby. For now, to focus 
on keeping mom alive. Tough as it was for his wife to get, give up the baby in order to fulfill their filial duties, she relented in the end. After reaching the decision in their family meeting and with the baby in tow, the couple headed out to the wilderness. What had been their pride and joy, they were now going to bury in the ground. No sooner had they begun digging than they hit the jackpot, a huge trove of gold and silver in goats, all with the wording, Heaven's gift to Philo San Kuchu, inscribed on them. The idea to bury the baby came about because they were poor. Now that they had struck it rich, they could afford to scrap that land. This public record is well known to every Chinese person. Many Chinese willingly follow filiality, not out of greed for riches, but because they recognize the importance of filial piety. Its transmission and translators. Fifth, the translators. According to some editions of the sutra, the Earth Star Sutra was translated by a Chinese Chibitaka master, Dharma master Fa Teng, Dharma Lamp, circa the late Chen dynasty. Some other editions list the translator as follows. Translated by Chibitaka master Shramana Shikshananda of Udiana during the Tang dynasty. Udiana during the Tang dynasty. During the Tang dynasty, roughly bordering China's Yunnan province, there used to be a kingdom whose name Udiana, which had a mythical origin. Legends had it that at the time when the kingdom did have a name which was beyond recall, its emperor, who was a hillist, prayed to the deity of a local temple for a son. Out came a baby from the forehead of the deity's image. Isn't that incredible?